thank you to uh, Dorothy, Poppy, and um, the Bobby Jones CSF Foundation. This is a, a wonderful organization that, uh, as you can see from today, is uh, pioneering the next steps. Um, so I'm going to share our journey with outcomes because I know this organization is very interested in progressing in that field. Um, so, of course, a lot of this work I have to credit to, to Diane Mueller for taking the lead uh, in our effort. Uh, the treatment dilemma, I think we all know. There's little agreement on the best surgical treatment for patients suffering from the Chiari-1 malformation. Treatment outcomes vary widely and there is significant treatment failure. Uh, so early in the 21st century, we wanted to study our own surgical outcomes and we decided to focus on quality of life. Does that answer everything? No, it doesn't. But that's what we decided to pursue. Um, we searched for quality of life questionnaire. This sickness impact profile uh, was one of the most widely used scales. Their self-reported symptoms on the functional status in three domains. So the number of domains is helpful uh, in uh, making sure that these scales are reliable. You want to look at a variety of different components. So this one is physical, psychosocial, and uh, independent function. These are the 12 categories. I won't uh, list them, but there are questions related to these categories. We published this outcome study in uh, 2005 in 112 of our patients uh, pre and post operatively one year uh, regarding their quality of life before and after surgery. Uh, we found statistically significant improvement in our patients at uh, 84% in their quality of life. Uh, patient age, the amount of tonsillar herniation, uh, and the presence of syringomyelia did not correlate with the outcome. In other words, some could get better, worse either way. Anecdotally, and I think this is a learning point and maybe as the scale from CSF is being created, this I think needs to be kept in mind. After we got the results, I asked Diane to call some of our patients to see that, call some of our patients that weren't doing well to see if there could be any other factors that impacted their quality of life. Um, and then at least four uh, one was a general health status change, another was an unrelated injury. One lady had a thor extensive thoracolumbar fusion for scoliosis that she was not doing well from, and another had lost her spouse and it impacted her quality of life. So if we measure quality of life a year, two, five years post uh, treatment, we do want to have a questionnaire that at least uh, helps us understand are there other factors that could be contributing to that uh, change in quality of life. Then there was a conference. It was in 2008 and uh, I was there um, and so was David Frim. Uh, my presentation interestingly was on um, arriving at a consensus for surgery for the Chiari-1 malformation. Um, and somebody uh, had made a comment and I sort of just automatically blurted out, the problem is we don't have a specific Chiari outcome scale. And uh, from Diane's comment, I know David was quite interested in that, in that blurt, if you will. And so um, two groups went to work. We didn't, I didn't know David was initially pursuing this. And so we developed a Chiari carry specific outcome scales because there were none. We had to find the sickness impact profile because there were no Chiari specific outcome scales. So basically we have three and I'll touch on these scales right now. Uh, Dr. Frim's group was the first out of the shoot if you will the 2012 he published his uh, outcome scale as you can see there. So let's talk about that scale briefly. It's a fairly straightforward scale. Um, there are pain symptoms, there's a four point score, uh, unchanged, improved, resolved. The higher the point score in this scale, the better the patient is doing. Non-pain symptoms, functionality, are there complications, and then you got a total score. Um, and the range then is four to 16. The higher the score, the more improvement. And again, these four domains, if you will, up here. Okay. 
So, um, and then we'll, there's been a critique of the scales and we'll touch on that. Dr. Limbrick uh, and his team um, at WashU um, performed the critique. So, when we were ready to uh, develop our own quality of life outcome score, disease specific, uh, we looked at the literature and there are a number of disease specific scales. Um, for instance, this one's instructive. It was initially developed, but then the Asia group uh, formed, they adopted and adapted this scale. So you can take a scale and adapt it to a newer expanded scale. Although I have not discussed this with uh, Dr. Mueller, Diane Mueller, uh, it is possible, for instance, if you choose to adapt a component of the Chiari sickness care symptom profile that that could be considered. In other words, maybe not reinvent the wheel, but nevertheless. So there are a number of scales available that are disorder specific. Why quality of life? Why did we choose quality of life? Because really that's the moral imperative. The reason we're here and we're treating is the patient's perception. So this is uh, the wording we used in the article, the moral implication of medical intervention has, has led clinicians to examine the quality of life as a significant outcome measure. The individual's self-perceived quality of life must, be, must imbue the opinions, experience, and expectations of the patient as the recipient. So I think any outcome scale needs to consider uh, in self-reported quality of life. Um, there are a lot of people to, that contributed, Kimberly Sexton and Data Curl, uh, and our statistician obviously can't do this without a statistician. There was a small grant to, from Conquer Chiari to support the statistical analysis. We use the Light Likert scale, sometimes called Likert scale, and I'll show you that scale. So this scale is very useful and it can be modified. The standard five point Again, this is five, even though it's, it goes to four, zero is one, so that it's a five-point scale, never to all of the time. And it's in four domains that are important to us as individuals. So what we did then is we scanned uh, hundreds, of, the nurses scanned hundreds of patient assessments, nurse practitioners, uh, and the literature to develop initially 70 questions. Then the statistician uh, and the team, uh, a convenient sample of seven, and they did inner item correlation matrix that suggested of these 70 questions, 13 were redundant. They were essentially asking the same thing in different formats. Phase two was 10 patients, uh, and that had a very high uh, inner item uh, correlation of 0.935 and uh, this demonstrating uh, integrity of all questions, excellent validity and reliability. Uh, then a uh, convenient sample uh, three was performed to verify that. Uh, and so we ended up, so this is the current Chiari symptom profile. It's available to anyone who wants to use it, no cost. Um, 57 questions, four domains, Likert scale, no disability is zero, severe disability would be 228. It's here just to give you an idea, um, some of the questions that uh, are in the scale, in the like curve. So they're fairly easy to, uh, to fill out. And compliance is high because we don't see them unless it's filled out. And we, we never have to force them if they haven't filled it out before they come in. They can fill it out on a computer online. What's nice about that, it's, it's automatically scored. Um, so there's high compliance in filling out. And so I won't read them all, but some of these obviously are symptom related. Here's quality of life, keeps me from participating in activities I enjoy. I'm working shorter or limited hours due to my symptoms. So imagine 57 questions that are trying to reach at how is this disorder or what is your quality of life? And then uh, to review the statistical conclusion, uh, using this uh, system here, this software, uh, statistics software, uh, Cronbach again, 0.958, uh, 
demonstrating strong reliability as a survey tool for Chiari symptoms. It was published in the Journal of Nurse, Nurse Science Nursing 2013. I uh, advocate that in your teams it's going to be nurse practitioners or PAs that are going to be the primary advocates of getting this work done. Um, if you consider the CSP, there are several uh, reasons to, to do so or something like it. Of course, we want to understand and quantify self-reported symptoms in the initial evaluation. We want an objective quantitative measure of the symptoms before and after decompression. It can also be used longitudinal analysis of quality of life. You can do five-year studies, you can do ten-year studies. Um, and then frankly, as you know your outcomes, that can, in, that can impact how you treat. Uh, why are the outcomes maybe lower than another group? Um, why are they higher? That should tell us something by looking at the outcomes. And then again, a similar fashion to compare outcomes in different institutions, which I think is eventually what we want if we want a standard of care. There are limitations to our scale. We <clears throat> did not design it to quantify the pre- and post-operative structural and dynamic components of the Chiari malformation. That was not our goal. It needs to be part of the future. There's no doubt, and I'll talk about that. <clears throat> so, um, therefore, it cannot be used to assess pre- and post-operative changes in the structural and dynamic components to inform our understanding of the reasons for the quality of life change. Uh, quality of life's improved, but it doesn't tell me, is it because I used a certain duraplasty? Is it because I used a certain amount of decompression? Um, size of decompression, if you will. So there's been an as independent assessment of outcome scales and that uh, senior author in this work is uh, Dr. Limbrick, who's um, in, at this meeting. <clears throat> and he, uh, initially they uh, did an external um, validation of the Chicago Chiari outcome scale. And then this is a fascinating uh, work they looked at a number of scales in Chiari malformation in a systematic review. Can I get some water? Thanks. <clears throat> um, thank you. <laughs> you have too much water. All the water's down. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so, <clears throat> this is a, a great effort. <clears throat> Excuse me. 74 papers met inclusion criteria. Um, they decided to group them, or could be grouped into three groups. Gestalt impressions. So 45 papers in the literature, Chiari outcomes are gestalt impressions. They're better, they're worse, there's no change. It's a gestalt that the clinician has after listening to the patient and examining the patient. Um, there were 20 papers that looked at specific signs and symptoms in it and then calculated outcomes depending on the improvement or lack of improvement. And 22 of these 74 papers did use standardized assessment scales. Six were disease specific, in other words, 11 were general quality of life. Uh, C, six disease specific, three of these scales were um, had been validated. And so the assessment of the Chicago outcome scale was that it was more reliable than the author's gestalt impression. However, it's designed for retrospective chart review and not suited for prospectively measuring patient-defined disease burden before and after treatment. And there was concern about the scales of functionality and non-pain symptoms, that they were less uh, reliable. Uh, that paper also assessed uh, the Chiari symptom profile that I've been discussing and noted that the recently developed Chiari symptom profile has shown strong content validity but has not yet been applied to outcomes research and that is correct. It's demonstrating validity in multiple domains is an important aspect of developing a meaningful outcome scale. Now, since my role is going to be changing pretty soon, one of the key things then is to take our patients to the Medical Center of Aurora. 
which are certainly going to be over 500, um, and try to give uh, an answer to that. What is our outcome using this tool in our patient population? Um, also, yeah, I think I've mentioned that. Now, I was at the Column of Hope this summer in June in Buffalo, and I met a Dr. Summit Thakkar at this institution of higher medical sciences. This hospital only treats cardiovascular and nurse surgery, and at least in Bangalore area, all patients uh, come here for that. Um, they do 20,000, they've done, basically they do about 1,500 surgeries per year. I do not know how many Chiari surgeries they do. But he recommended to the audience that the CSP be incorporated into outcome measures. And Marcus Studley, who directed the conference, also supported that. But I think you can't not use the CSP solely. So the, let's, so kind of wrapping up, let's talk about the next generation scales. Where do we want to go? Where are we going? So I think the first of the next generation scales, again, is by Dr. Limbrick and his team uh, at WashU. And it is, um, it looks at both the clinical and neuroimaging characteristics. And I think that's what we need. We clearly need patient quality of life measures. Again, we're trying to help the patient. It's all about that. But we also want to know what should we do, how, what should we change, etc. What, uh, what changes in the neuroanatomy, for instance, change um, outcome. And I, if I had my dream outcome scale, uh, this would be a draft. Of course, we'd want to have demographics, age, gen gender, ethnicity, I'm tired today. <laughs> a comprehensive symptom profile, including detailed subsections. Now, that, I think this is important. We all know the common presentation. I mean, it's usually headache, usually valsalva related, usually dizziness, uh, a number of other symptoms. But there are, uh, uh, you know, cognitive symptoms, uh, the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. We need to, and Dr. Limbrick also brought this up in his paper, we need to look at rare presentations. Um, we need to understand cerebellar fits in children more related to Chiari. There are two children with paroxysmal rage that present, and they're in the literature. I suspect there may be more. We don't know that. This is hidden information. Um, Seth nerve, nerve palsy, hemifacial spasm related to Chiari malformation. Rare, I'm seeing a young man right now with uh, palatal myoclonus with Chiari malformation. There's only one case in the literature. Um, obviously extremely rare. We, as already has been touched on, need to look at, at associated conditions. Uh, pseudotumor cerebri, the whole list. Well, the three keys that I, three symptoms or disorders that I worry a lot when I see folks are pseudotumor cerebri, fairly common, CSF hypotension, a real detriment to have an operation without recognizing that condition and craniocervical instability. Uh, but there are a number of others. Um, what would this, what, what do we also need to keep an eye on? Body mass, uh, these are our choices here. And I, I, there's no consensus or it's not really been discussed. But certainly body mass and HSCRP are clues to pseudotumor cerebri. Vitamin D can have neurological effects, um, although hemoglobin A1C is a different disorder. You don't want to be treating a pre-diabetic unless they're managed. And unfortunately, um, these, this, for instance, in our practice, about three out of four are going to have a deficiency here. And we occasionally find pre-diabetics. Rarely do we find diabetics in a neurosurgical clinic. Fundoscopy in, the, in visual fields and elevated body mass. Of course, we need to record the neurological findings, including autonomic findings. We need static three-plane MRI imaging. Chiari is not a sagittal disorder. It's how we diagnose it, five millimeter rule, one plane. It is not only a sagittal disorder. It is an axial disorder. It is a coronal disorder. It's a three-dimensional disorder. 
We need to quantify deformation of the medulla. Uh, the tissue trains, uh, strain studies pioneered by Dr. Henderson, um, of course, are uh, very helpful. <clears throat> and I think the future, if you really wanted to know what I think we hopefully will have in the next generation, is defining Chiari and assessing its treatment and outcome with 3D imaging. What is the volume of the cisterna magna? Well, what, is, uh, what are the complex neuroanatomy relationships? How do those tonsils wrap around? We know you can, why do some people have Chiari zero, okay? It tells us that five millimeter is just a rough guideline. Well, they have it because they don't have the sagittal hang down, but they have the lateral wraparound of the brainstem and deformity of the brainstem. And we have to begin to analyze on axial views that, um, that change. Um, <clears throat> of course, we have to define what treatment is usual, utilized. I will make a comment about suboccipital decompression. Our, and this is just our standard, so, but these longitudinal dimension, two and a half centimeters, usually to three. It's rare that you can do four, measure it on your own. But that, if that elevation of decompression, of the longitudinal decompression, I think is arguable, or is general consensus, I would say. It's the transverse amount of decompression that's done. And the key thing is to measure the transverse dimension of the frame and magnum. It's gonna be about 30, in an adult, might be 27 in a younger person, and I don't treat children, so, but clearly it's, we have to use our skull-based principles to uh, get the choke point decompressed, which is at the foramen. Then we go longitudinal. These very large decompressions, now I, I think if you want to do four centimeters transverse, I don't have any issue with that. But unfortunately we treat a number of the people that have up to seven centimeters of bone removed. If the skin is not closed, they have a blowout. We've destroyed their, um, their tension band. We're ignoring the spinal tension band of what keeps our head in balance here. So when you see folks that have had these decompressions and all they have is skin above, the, above, this, above a water pocket, uh, you can press on that and pressurize them. That needs to be rebuilt. So some of the plates we have to have specially designed are more than seven centimeters to be able to reconstruct, pull that muscle and try to recreate the tension band. So I do have obviously strong opinions on that issue. Um, then obviously we're going to talk about this, about bone only, what materials used, how do you test your duroplasty, do you use a dural sealant, all these need to at least be recorded so we can eventually say this works better than that, this is the way to test the duroplasty, etc. We don't have answers to these questions and again I've just mentioned reconstruction of the tension band. Uh, I'm finishing up. Um, so, and then we obviously have to be more detailed and probably have to have forms to define the tonsor morphology and laterality. Is there pointing? Is there fibrosis? Is there cystic degeneration of the tips of the tonsils? What about this lateral medullary con compression? What about the occasional third nerve, eleventh nerve pathology with beating of the nerve from the chronic compression? That's been defined but maybe not discussed a lot. And again, fibrosis, cystic degeneration of the tonsillar tip should be recorded. Uh, we need a way to um, assess medullary elongation. Intraoperative ultrasonography can be used to uh, see what's happening. Uh, we certainly, in some patients, see severe tonsillar pistoning. I've seen occasional what I call trampolining, because I have no better word for that. As they um, piston, then you can see the cervical cord doing almost like a trampoline. And then of course the, the longitudinal med extent of the medullary compression, uh, the amount of movement, that's the other thing. In some of the ultrasounds we can actually see the medulla pulsing. That should be able to be characterized. And then uh, in the future should we have 3D um, CINE studies to tell us the hydrodynamics and how important is that and that, can that correlate with outcome. So anyway, in conclusion, 
a Chiari specific outcome instrument that measures symptoms, quality of life, surgical steps, radiologic outcome, would facilitate comparison of outcomes across institutions and reduce the disparity in surgical techniques currently utilized. Thank you. responses from owners is also challenging so that made me wonder with your tools that you guys are developing are you taking into account caregivers in the sense of maybe for the pediatric patients you can't complete these on their own I, I think that's fascinating <clears throat> I don't treat beyond 14 at the present time I used to many years ago um, so yeah I think caregiver probably has a lot to do with quality of life so I, that would be wonderful, uh, but I have not seen any developed for that. Yes. How do you account for the high rate of depression? Oh wow! That's I, to me out of everything. That's the most fascinating part of this disorder. So this, I mean, you know, I was I grew up in the cerebellum was this coordination balance. Maybe if you were a great pianist, you know, you had a more beautiful cerebellum, etc. I mean, that's how I thought of it. And clearly, we now know that, and the Japanese are mapping it to the posterior central cerebellum above the tonsils. So, not that those fibers seem to input up here, but basically, it's the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. It is. Uh, multitasking, finding the right word, short-term memory, some of the effective components are anxiety and depression. So they're, they're almost not reactive anxiety and depression to a situation, they are anxiety and depression. The depression component has been uh, confirmed in pediatric uh, tumor, uh, cerebellar tumor patients in, in a study in Germany. So we do know that those findings are real and, and to me, you know, if somebody can walk in with a four or five millimeter tonsil or herniation and headaches, I don't know if the Chiari is incidental or not. Uh, so if they start saying, you know, my boss is starting to look at me because, you know, my memory is off or, or mom says the wrong word, uh, I, I can't get my words out, or my school performance was here and now it's here, you know, now it's dropped down. I think these cerebellar cognitive and affective s symptoms are more of a part of Chiari than we realize. And frankly, to me, there are clues that something's going on because so many of us can have headaches. So I think it's fascinating. I think if we re all begin to record it as we see folks, we'll be able to characterize, is it 15%? Is it 20%? Like those, like those standard depression screening questions built into this uh, well, depression and mood, we do have questions in the questionnaire about are you depressed or et cetera, but they're not, they're not specific subscales. And I think we, once something is triggered, then we ought to have a specific subscale for cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome or other components, of, especially if they're rare presentations. That's precious information. You know, these folks are lost a lot of times. Um, because they may not have the classic headache, um, but uh, you can track that progression also. And then the outcome D does, and am I going to affect the uh, cerebellar cognitive function by uh, reducing the tonsils? Okay, we don't think so, but we don't know for sure. Okay, some of the ophthalmology studies have shown that just above the tonsils, you can affect some functions. Now, fortunately, when I've seen a few optic functions, they've, they've settled, um, but it's a concern. I mean, I think the tonsils, we need to know a little more about them. On the other hand, we do know that reduction of elongated compressed tonsils in a severe patient with carrier malformation can make a significant improvement in the quality of their life.